In this video, we're going to be looking at topic 3A energetics as part of the IGCSE chemistry course from NXL. And we're going to be focusing on these single science outcomes. So we're going to be looking at exothermic and endothermic reactions and how we describe these reactions or distinguish between them. We'll be looking at simple calorimetry experiments to determine enthalpy changes for combustion, displacement, dissolving and neutralisation. How we calculate energy change using Q is equal to MC delta T, as well as the actual practical nature of all of these calorimetry experiments. So let's start off by looking at exothermic reactions. You have learned these back in key stage three, particularly in year nine. And if we have a reaction that gives out heat to the surroundings, then we call this exothermic reactions. And this means that our products are going to have less energy than the reactants because the reactants are releasing or losing that heat to the surroundings. And when we see that, the chemical energy stored in the bonds being converted to heat energy, what we see is a rise in temperature. So you will see your temperature increase for an exothermic reaction. Some key examples are combustion reaction, or remember combustion is another word for burning. We have metals and acids. Neutralization reactions, which you have met in topic 2F, which was acids and alkalis, and also displacement reactions as well. Now, an endothermic reaction is the opposite, and this is where we take in heat from the surroundings. And this is, as we said, an endothermic. So in this case, the products are going to have more energy than the reactants because the reactants are absorbing energy to make the products. And when this absorption of heat energy happens, we're going to see the temperature going down because we're taking away the heat energy from the surroundings. Some key endothermic reactions are thermal decomposition, chemical cold packs, dissolving ammonium chloride and water, and photosynthesis that you will have covered in biology. Now we also have enthalpy changes, which is determined as delta H. And we can see here, this is not a triangle, this is the Greek letter delta, and it simply means change. So H being our enthalpy and the delta telling us our change. And this is the amount of heat energy that is taken in or given out for any reaction. And it's calculated by the difference in the energy between the products and the energy of the reactants. If delta H is negative, then the reaction is exothermic. So we have seen our temperature rise. If delta H is positive, then the reaction is endothermic, so we have seen our temperature decrease. And we will look at some examples of these in just a minute. Another key term that we have to know is the specific heat capacity, and you may have covered this in physics. And specific heat capacity of a substance is the amount of heat that is needed to raise the temperature of one gram by one degree Celsius. Okay, so it is heat energy relating to one gram by one degree Celsius. So it has the units joules, so this is our energy, per gram, this is our mass, per degree Celsius, so this is our temperature. The specific heat capacity of water is 4.18, or sometimes you may see it written as 4.2 joules, per gram per degree Celsius. So if we are using this number in an equation, we need to be relating it to energy, mass and temperature. And that leads us on to how we actually calculate a heat energy change. So the amount of heat energy, or in this case Q, is directly proportional to the mass, which is M, and the temperature change, which again, that delta, and it is delta T. Now remember, our specific heat capacity was joules per gram per Celsius. So joules per gram per Celsius. So we have our heat, our mass, and our temperature change. So we can actually calculate the heat energy by using this equation here, 
which is the heat energy change or Q is equal to the mass times the specific heat capacity times the temperature change. And we will look at how we actually use this in an equation or in an example in just a few minutes. So let's look at the first practical. This is the enthalpy of combustion. And this is a key practical that you may be asked about in an exam. Now, of course, we cannot just simply burn an alcohol because alcohols are extremely flammable. So we have to take very good care when we're carrying out a practical like this. So what we do is we use something called a spirit burner and we use this to burn the alcohol. And the spirit burner is a glass jar that has got a rope that is soaked in the alcohol that is then set on fire. So you're not actually setting the liquid on fire and combusting the, the liquid itself. You're combusting the liquid that has been soaked up by the rope and the spirit burner. And you'll probably carry this out in class so your teacher will be able to show you what a spirit burner looks like. Now, because this is a combustion reaction, we cannot simply just put a thermometer into it because we're going to have the temperature change being masked by the flame of the alcohol being burned. So what we do is we get the heat energy being released and we use it to heat water in a copper can and we surround that copper can by insulation. The reason that we use copper is it's a very good conductor of heat, but once the heat is in the copper can, we do not want it to escape, which is why we use the insulation. We heat the water for a reasonable temperature change. It can be anywhere between probably 15 to 40 degrees Celsius, and then we can calculate Q. So in this equation, we have got ethanol which is C2H5OH, and it is being burned or undergoing complete combustion. And when we have complete combustion, we're going to make carbon dioxide and water. So if we look at the calculation that we need, we need some key information here. We need the volume of water that is used, which is 100 centimeters cubed. We need the starting temperature, and the ending temperature. Now it is important to note these two, which is the mass of the burner before and after the experiment to tell you how much ethanol has been burned. However, using that number in a calculation is double content. So if you want to know how to do that, you can certainly check out the double video on this. But for single science, you're not going to need to know how much ethanol is burned. You simply need the volume of water and the the starting and end temperatures. So what we do is we then calculate our Q value or our heat energy. So C is 4.18. If they want you to use 4.2, they will tell you that in the question. Now M is going to be 100. Now water has a density of one gram per centimeter cubed. And what that means is that one gram of water is one centimetre cubed, or one centimetre cubed of water weighs one gram. So whatever volume we have, that is going to be the same mass. So our mass is 100, and our temperature change is simply 62.8, take away 21.5, which gives us 41.3. I substitute all those numbers in. It gives me an answer in joules. And to get to kilojoules, I would divide by 1000. We typically want our answers in kilojoules unless the question specifies. And because we see a temperature rise, then we put a negative sign. And that tells us that the reaction is exothermic. So we see a temperature rise. So our heat energy released in this experiment is negative 17.260 kilojoules. Now the typical value for the combustion of ethanol is minus 1,370 kilojoules per mole. Now if we were to do the molar enthalpy calculation here, which as I said is double, we may get an answer that is of course higher than our original answer of 17.2, however, is going to be nowhere near this combustion value. And what that tells is that the experimental value 
is less exothermic. So that seems like the burning of ethanol is giving out less heat. Now that's not actually the case. What's actually happening is that we have sources of error. And this is a very common exam question. So please make sure that you do take a note of these. So the most common sources of error in this experiment are heat loss to the surroundings. And that could be due to a lack of insulation. It could be that the flame is too far away from the copper can. Um, various different reasons. And the other one is incomplete combustion. And if we have incomplete combustion, what we see is soot forming on the copper can. So we're getting that buildup of carbon because we don't have enough oxygen and that's stopping the amount of heat energy that is being released. Incomplete combustion is going to release less heat energy than complete combustion. So a way to get around these in a lab is we would use something called a bomb calorimeter and that reduces all of these errors because it burns your substance in pure oxygen which guarantees complete combustion and it is completely encased in a plastic cover so it means that no heat energy is going to be released to the surroundings so all of the heat is being transferred to the water. Now, you're not going to be asked too much about um, a bomb calorimeter. What you would be asked about are these sources of error. If we look at another practical, this is the enthalpy of displacement. So we take a metal of a solution with of a less reactive metal. So remember, you've looked at the reactivity series in topic 2D. So if we take zinc and copper sulfate, zinc is higher on the reactivity series than copper, which means the zinc will take the place of the copper and will displace it. So what we do is we stir on the metal powder to the solution and we wait until we have reached a maximum temperature and we just simply stir it. And we can see here that we're using a polystyrene cup and that's to keep the heat in. We use a glass beaker and that's just to make sure that the polystyrene cup doesn't tip over because the polystyrene cup is quite light. And of course, we use a lid again to keep all of the heat in. And once we do this, we can then calculate Q. So again, we've got our equations. We have zinc metal plus copper sulfate giving you zinc sulfate and copper. So we have our key information here. We have our volume of water, our starting and maximum temperatures. Now again, we don't need the mass because the mass is a double calculation, but it is good to see how much it is that is being burned, or sorry, how much that is that is being displaced. So we again put in our values, our specific heat capacity is 4.18. Our mass, remember 50 centimetres cubed, is going to weigh 50 grams. And our delta T is 27.3, take away 17 which is 10.3, and we get our value in joules, dividing by 1,000 to get kilojoules, and we get a value of 2.1527 kilojoules, and because we have this negative sign, we are getting an exothermic reaction because we are seeing a rise in temperature. Now, enthalpy of solution is very similar, where we're um, in this case, dissolving a salt into water, but the setup is the same as the displacement. All we are changing is just the substances that are being used. So we have our beaker with our polystyrene cup, our lid and our reaction mixture, and we weigh out a specific mass of a salt and we add it into water so that it dissolves. And we stir, and this time we're looking for the minimum temperature. So we should see a temperature decrease this time. And again, we can calculate Q. Now looking at the calculation for this practical, we have our volume of water as 100 centimetres cubed. And remember, 100 centimetres cubed is going to weigh 100 grams. We have our starting temperature and our minimum temperature of water. So delta T is going to be 18.3 take away 15.1, which gives us 3.2. 
I substitute all of those numbers into my Q is equal to CM delta T calculation, and I get an answer of 1.3376 kilojoules. This time, notice that we use a positive sign, and that tells us that the reaction is endothermic because we get a temperature increase. Sorry, a temperature decrease. Now, enthalpy of neutralisation is the last practical that you have to know about. It is set up very similar to an enthalpy of displacement or solution. However, you may sometimes use a burette in order to add the acid in this case. So the reaction involves a reaction of an acid and an alkali to form a salt and water. The problem with this isn't so much how you carry it out, it's the, how you analyse the results. So this is a little bit more complex because we have to use a graph in order to determine the temperature change. And from that temperature change, then we can calculate Q. So if we look at the graph that we have to do, when you carry out this practical, what you see is that the reaction is increasing and then it decreases. Now, the reaction overall is exothermic, so we should only see an increase in temperature, but we do also see this decrease. Now, the reason for this is because we don't necessarily know the exact amount that is going to require the neutralisation of our alkali. So what we do is we add some acid and we will then get to a point where the neutralisation has finished and that is our maximum temperature. So at the max temp is our neutralization endpoint and that's what we're trying to determine but there will come a point where you are simply adding cold acid to the alkali and that is then going to cause the temperature to decrease so what we do is we carry out the experiment we then plot the results onto a graph and we draw two lines of best fit so we draw a line of best fit when we have our increasing temperatures and then we draw a line of best fit for when we have our decreasing temperatures and there will come a point where the two lines cross over and that is the exact amount of acid that was needed and also the temperature that we have for our maximum temperature. Now we can carry out our calculation. So our total volume is the amount of acid read from our graph, which in this case was 28, plus the volume of alkali, which was 53. So remember, 53 centimetres cubed, we're going to assume they have the same density, so that's going to be 53 grams. And my delta T in this case is going to be my end temperature, which I read from my graph is 31.8 take away my starting temperature, which I recorded as 19.3, and that gives me a value of 12.5. If I then substitute those numbers into my Q is equal to CM delta T equation, I get an answer of 2.7693, and we have our negative sign to tell us that this is an exothermic reaction because we have a temperature rise. Now, when we do any sort of enthalpy or heat energy calculation, there are some assumptions that we make, okay? And we do need to take these into account to explain sometimes why our answers are not exactly what we would expect them to be. So we assume that the density of any solution being tested or being heated is going to be the same as the density of water. Now, this is not always technically true, but the majority of the solutions that we will use will be made mostly of water. Um, they will tend to be an aqueous substance. So we make this assumption that one centimetre cubed of the solution is equal to one gram, meaning they have a density of one gram per centimetre cubed. Now, the specific heat capacity of any substance, we also make the assumption that it is the same as water. So we assume that they all have a specific heat capacity of 4.18 or 4.2. Again, you would be confirmed which one you want to use in the question, but you would never use a value that is not one of these two numbers. And we also assume that the mass of any solid that is added to a water sample, such as when we have a solution or a displacement reaction, is so small that it is not going to affect the overall mass. Because when we're working out 
the m value for our calculation we simply only take the mass of water so we're assuming that the solid is having no effect now of course we know that it will but for the sake of keeping these nice and simple we just ignore it let's finish off by looking at a past paper question Butane, C4H10, is a gas at room temperature and pressure, and it can undergo complete combustion as shown in the equation below. And we can use butane in a combustion experiment to determine its delta H value. So question A is asking us what does delta H stand for? So remember the H is enthalpy and the triangle is delta, which means change. So this stands for enthalpy change. The table shows the results of the experiment, so we have the mass of water, the mass of butane, an initial temperature and a final temperature, and we want to use the equation to show the heat produced when we burn this specific amount of butane. So remember our heat produced is going to be Q, the mass of water is M, we times that by C, in this case they're telling us is 4.2, and times that by delta T. So our mass of water is 200 so that's m delta t is going to be equal to 43.7 take away 20.2 which is a value of 23.5 so i substitute in my values and i get 200 times 4.2 times 23.5 and i get a value of 19740 And that is in kilojoules. And I, sorry, that's in joules. If I want to convert that into kilojoules, I then divide it by a thousand. So I get 19.74 kilojoules. Okay, I will want to make sure that I put the correct value onto the line. In this case, it is in joules. So my answer should be 19740. And because I'm seeing a temperature rise, I want to put a negative sign to tell me that it is exothermic. So the student uses the value from B to calculate a delta H value or the enthalpy of combustion and he calculates it as minus 1580. He's not made any mistakes in his calculation but the data book value is minus 288.7 kilojoules per mole. So first of all, what is the significance of the negative sign? Well, that tells us that the reaction is exothermic. So we should always include a sign, either negative or positive, in our enthalpy value. So the student notices at the end of the experiment that the bottom of the beaker is covered in black soot. How is this formed? Well, any time that we're getting soot tells us that we have incomplete combustion of the, the butane. And that's forming this carbon. So we want to then explain how the formation of this soot might account for the difference between the experimental delta H value and the data book. So what we saw was that the experimental was a lower value. So this is giving or causing less heat energy being produced. So when we have this formation of soot, we're getting incomplete combustion and that gives off less energy than the complete combustion would. And another reason why two, the two delta values, delta H values could be different, well, there are various different reasons. Remember I said to memorize these sources of error and the most common one is heat loss to the surroundings. We could also have that there is no lid or no insulation. That would also be an accepted answer because that would account for why we're getting heat loss to the surroundings. So there's the mark scheme for those past paper questions if you want to check your answers. That's everything for topic 3A energetics. Hopefully everything has made sense, but feel free to leave a comment below if you're not sure and we hope to see you back soon.